Well, good morning and happy Easter to all of you. Happy Resurrection Day. We are so excited to be in person this year and not be watching this all on the computer screen. But uh, we're going to sing. We're going to just uh, lift high Jesus Christ. And so here's, here's our only request is as people kind of make their way in, we've got a stack of chairs. And so uh, those can be filled out. But if, if people are kind of needing a nudge in, just do your best to scoot in to people you know and, and give space. But uh, we want to try to make room for everybody. But uh, I want to just give you a couple things before we start. This box over here, if you weren't here Friday, it makes no sense to you whatsoever. And I apologize because I don't think you can see inside of that box. But here's what's in there. Um, our theme this Easter season has been death, the doorway to resurrection. And um, so on Good Friday, we had a service and, and we, we just kind of corporately lamented the loss of the last year and uh, pressed into what we had been grieving over a year's time and and really tried to as a body take those things to the lord and this door was closed and it represented just the darkness and the ominous threat of death and that most of us spend a lot of our energy trying to avoid death not just physically but death of all kinds of things death of our dreams our hopes our plans death of our passions and the things that, that we really care about we try to maintain a grip on those because we're often convinced that, that were those things to, to be given over to death, it would be the end. But Jesus Christ shows us the power over death. And that death is not the thing to be feared above all else. It is the means by which we enter into his resurrected life. And so our, our focus on Friday was how do we entrust our pain and our grief and our sorrow to the Lord? Trusting that because Christ conquered the grave, he conquers everything else. And if we are in Christ, everything will literally be used for our good in some way to glorify God. And so how do we worship and honor him with even our greatest pains? And so this morning, uh, I just woke up early, was out here just thinking of the Marys running to the tomb and what they must have been feeling and thinking. And then upon seeing the angel sitting on top of that stone and, and just the tomb wide open. And what Jesus does is he bursts forth life where only death could exist previously. And so that's our hope as we worship, and that's what the flowers and the greenery is. It's just to help us think on there is life beyond the grave, and there is life beyond what we have lost over the last year, no matter what kind of loss that's been. And so our prayer for you this morning is that you would be brought into the joy, the legitimate joy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and your worship would be fueled by his power, his goodness, and his glory. And so, uh, anyway, as we sing, you can just even glance over and just think of, of what life might come from the pain and the loss, even of the last year, because our God is sovereign, yeah. And so, uh, we're going to begin. I'm going to pray for us. Just commit our time to the Lord, and then Rachel is going to lead us in a reading of uh, 1 Corinthians 15, a bit of that. So, if you'll pray with me. Father, thank you that you are, you are sovereign over everything. At Advent, we remember that you were sovereign over dates and places and cities and stables and kings and that you, throughout millennia, saw fit to make sure that every prophetic word spoken about Messiah would come to pass. 
And as we consider it on a good Friday, that you are sovereign even over a piece of clothing. That because Christ's tunic was seamless, that they would cast lots so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And if you are sovereign over a piece of clothing, you are surely, so- surely sovereign over our lives. And if you care about lilies and sparrows, surely we're more precious than they. And so as we worship this Resurrection Sunday, may we not just worship because it's an emotional day, because it's a special day, because it's a holiday, because of the festivities that we partake in, but because of the substance of our hope. That you reign as king over every facet of our lives and we can entrust ourselves entirely because we are raised with Christ. And so we worship you in faith. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would shepherd us, you would care for us, you would minister grace and mercy to us and that you would shape us after the likeness of Christ. Our joy would be united in him. And so we pray it, excited to be together, thankful for proximity and time and space with one another. But we give you everything, and we ask that you would be glorified in everything that takes place. And we pray it, Jesus, unto your name. Amen. So this is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 through 57. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand together and sing this. Spirit lost and searched 
death is undone, hallelujah. Jesus has won, hallelujah. We overcome, oh, in Jesus, oh, in Jesus, hallelujah. Death is undone, hallelujah. Jesus has won. We put out a, a guide, which was a prayer from Every Moment Holy for the sunrise. And uh, if, you, if you read that this morning, there's a little excerpt that we're going to read now from that that I think really beautifully captures the, uh, the essence of what Christ came to do. And so Rachel's going to read this for us, and we'll sing uh, one more song. For it was your intention from creation's dawn, not only to make all things, but to make all things right. When your works were despoiled and wrecked by sin and death, you undertook to save and to reclaim what you had first made good. You entered into this, our space and time, to act on our behalf. You took on body, blood, and breath that you, clothed in our condition, might move in sympathy to save and shelter us. For in the living temple of your flesh, perfect justice and perfect mercy were met and there in the shedding of your blood they were forever reconciled in love so you subdued the sting of sin by death you conquered death you rescued us from the fear of death and from its power you have made all things well O Christ you have made all things well yeah. let's just sing this hymn together Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. All creation joins to say, hallelujah. Raise your joys and triumphs high, hallelujah. Sing ye heavens and earth reply, Alleluia. Is again our glorious King, Alleluia. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting, Alleluia. Die Alleluia, where thy victory, O grave, Alleluia. Love's redeeming work is done, Alleluia, fought the fight, the
Christ has led. Alleluia. Following our exalted head. Alleluia. Made like Him, like Him we rise. Alleluia. Ours across the grave, the skies. actually watch a, a brief video just from one of the members, uh, a couple in our church who has experienced a bit of death and pain over the last year, and it's just their story of how Christ has begun to redeem that already. But uh, if you will, go before the Lord's throne with me one more time, Father. There's such joy in the words, uh, and to think that this, this last set of lyrics was written 1700s and yet we today can just take hold and, and go yes yes he is still our one hope he is still our one joy he is still our one peace it is still his death that atones for my sin it is still his resurrection that guarantees us life it is still christ and his gospel that is a hope of the church and the world and we praise you that in an ever-shifting culture you are steadfast that you never change, that you never alter. And so we have a, an anchor. We have something to take hold of in every season because you will not shift. And I pray that you would be exalted as we consider the glory of the resurrection of Christ and what it, it does in us and gives us as your people. But thank you again for the church. Thank you that it is a living bride. Thank you that we have the gift of one another and thank you for the privilege of reminding one another through song of the glory of our hope and the glory of our God. And may we never tire gathering together to lift you high. And so uh, we just thank you for your power to redeem that which is dead, that which was lost, that which was ruined by all human accounts that you in your authority, your power, your goodness can make all things new. And that is our future. So may we boast in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. You can't see. Hi, my name is Brandon, and this is my wife Natalia. We are the Everlies. And we're missing our little baby because we didn't want to bring her to the house fire, um, Eliana. I think we can all agree that 2020 has been a year like none other. But even in the midst of that, uh, near the end of 2020, my wife and I were still receiving blessings from God. At the end of the year, we received the news of our first child. I got a new job. My wife was looking at getting her job all in 2020 amidst COVID, amidst the political climate. Everything was looking up. We had what many would consider the American dream. We realized that that can be taken away very quickly. On February 1st of 2021, our house caught fire. Uh, this is not what we expected, but through it all, God has shown us blessing in ways that we couldn't imagine. Part of the American dream, we work for it ourselves and God has definitely provided, but one of the themes through the church in 2020 was, our hope is not here. Among the political climate, our hope is not with that. 
Our hope is not in our health with COVID. Our hope is only in Jesus Christ. And having everything taken with our house, with our belongings, it has really just shown us how God can still provide. And one of the ways he has done that is just through the loving body of Christ. So one thing that my wife and I would like to say to the Clearwater Community Church is thank you. God, through you, has blessed us in ways that we can't even imagine. We don't have people just saying, I'll pray for you, in a way that says, yeah, I'll get to it when I get to it. We have people that stop us and say, let's pray right now. We don't have people saying, oh, we'll help if we can. We have people offering to loan us cars while they're on vacation to provide for our physical needs. So when all things look like they're just crashing around you, just remember, God is the one who blesses you. None of this matters. And the importance of the church body is irrefutably just amazing. Amen. He is risen. We'll do it one more time. He is risen. Amen. We celebrate that on this Resurrection Sunday. You can take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We are going to look at uh, verses 12 to 19. The beauty of 1 Corinthians 15 is that it gives us so many Resurrection Sunday messages out of it. It, it would be virtually impossible to preach this entire chapter. And so uh, we've preached sections of it over the years, and we're going to hone in on a, a section of it today in verses 12 to 19 that we haven't preached before. Uh, we've entitled this message, Resurrection All or Nothing. All or Nothing. When you hear that expression, all or nothing, um, it, it speaks of putting everything into it. It's an expression that, and I'm going to use an illustration here that would get me in trouble with my conservative past, but I'm going to use an illustration from poker. Um, the, uh, when I was, uh, we were a couple weeks ago, we were on vacation and we were on a trip with, uh, over spring break with some of the youth, and uh, we, we were playing games each and every night, and there was a a set of poker chips there and so we decided to play poker with the girls now there was absolutely no money involved no gambling none of that okay um, it was just simply the chips that were there and we were many of them hadn't played this before and uh, some of us have watched poker on plenty of television and the you know the, the championships and all of that that are there and so you know we're trying to explain it to them and play it and use strategy and all of this stuff well, one of the girls comes into the room and she wants in and so we give her her stack of chips and the first hand that she gets She's like, I'm all in. And we were like, what? You know, like, uh, is she bluffing? Is this for real? Does she understand how the game plays? And so we're all just trying to figure that out. And, um, you know, somebody finally calls her all in. And all she had was king high. That's what she ended up with. And she was out of the game instantly <laughs> like that. Um, and then we let her back into the game. We gave her chips again. And, like, this is not how you do this. And course then she ends up finishing second I think like she gets all the way to the end she picked it up pretty quick um, but one of the moms that was there was like please do not it tells her daughter please do not let her play poker in college when you go off to college because she's gonna lose all her money you're not her response of all in and she said this after the game I just wanted to say all in I've always wanted to do that that's yes but there's very few things in life I don't know about you, that I'm willing to take that risk on, right? Even a game where there's no money in it, it's just chips there. They're just pieces of plastic. We still look at that and I'm like, I'm not going to go all in too many times. Paul, though, in this passage in Roman, or 1 Corinthians chapter 15, points out in, this verse, in these verses here, the concept of resurrection is an all or nothing scenario in which you have to believe all of it. You have to go all in with the resurrection and its implications, or none of it is of any value. So let's take a little bit deeper look at this all-or-nothing reality of resurrection. Before we jump into verses 12 through 19, let's start back in verse 1, because it really does lay the foundation of what Paul means here when he speaks of resurrection. He says this, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you have now taken a hold of. 
in which, by which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of Christ. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. Now I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. In these first 11 verses, Paul speaks of the gospel message to which he and the apostles have given their lives. This is the distinguishing feature that initiates and then breathes life into Christianity, this gospel truth about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, the story of the gospel culminates in this work of Jesus Christ. This is what we believe. That Jesus Christ died for our sins. That you and I can't come into a right relationship with God based on our works, on our efforts, on our good deeds. We don't come into right relationship with the God of this universe because we had some ritual performed on us when we were a child. We don't come into right relationship with Jesus Christ because of the family that we were born into or because we go to church no, what brings us into right relationship with God is the fact that God looked at us sinners, those who, because of our sin, are separated from a holy God and can do nothing to bring ourselves back into right relationship with that God. And God looked at us in that helpless state and he sent his son to die for us. That Jesus died for our sins. And then that Jesus rose from the dead. Not only to deliver us from our sins, but to give us life, eternal life, and real hope. And the challenge of the gospel that I first want to present to you this morning is just that. Do you believe that truth? Have you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? for your salvation, for your right standing with God. Maybe you're gathered here this morning with us and you, you come to this service because you know mom and dad are at this service or relatives or friends are at this service and it just feels like the right thing to do on Easter Sunday. But you haven't fully embraced the sacrifice and work of Jesus Christ on your behalf. Today, you need to do that to come into right relationship with God. Maybe you're asking for more proof. Follow along then as we speak through the rest of this message and what it challenges us concerning the work of Christ, especially in his resurrection. But in these opening verses, as Paul lays out the truth of the resurrection, he comes to verse 12 and he gets to the problem that was going on in this church. He says this, we preach this message, the apostles preach this message, the grace of God has even saved me a sinner. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? It seems like some in this church, this church at Corinth, while embracing the idea that Christ rose from the dead, believed and were teaching and were saying that there is no ultimate resurrection of the dead. And that raises a question, why would some within the church that believed the message that Christ had been raised from the dead, why would some of those not believe in a resurrection, a future resurrection? It seems to mean that they don't believe in the future resurrection of us as believers, that that won't be an event that lays in front of us. 
And there might be some reason behind that. Some may have thought that the believer's resurrection had already occurred at salvation. That seems weird to us, but think about who Paul is writing to here. He's writing to the Corinthians. And one of the distinguishing features of this early church as they received the gospel, as they placed their faith and trust in Jesus, was that as, as they did that, the Holy Spirit came upon them and filled them. And what stood out within that church at Corinth? Many of them experienced supernatural giftings of the Holy Spirit. We know from this letter that they were able, many of them, to speak in tongues, to prophesy, and these manifestations of this supernatural work of the Holy Spirit came upon many of them. And it seems that maybe some of them within the church then saw that coming of the Holy Spirit and all of that supernatural work that was now manifest in their life as the resurrection of Jesus Christ taking up residence within them and this was the display of his resurrection power within their life so much so that there would not be a future physical resurrection of their bodies. The, the Holy Spirit had so transformed their life that there was no need for a future resurrection. It may also be the case that some of them simply had difficulty, like many do today, understanding and then buying into the concept that this physical body will have some sort of eternal, heavenly, new creation existence to it. And that really did fly in the face of some of the philosophy of that day, that in a dualistic thought, that the, the spiritual side of us, the soul side of us, is much more important than the body side of us, the physical side to us. And so this physical part will ultimately die, and then that will release the spiritual part of us, in a sense, into glory. And that's the more important part. So why would we want this body somehow to come back to life when we reach that higher state of spiritual existence? So they denied the resurrection of the physical body. And there are plenty today, even in churches across America, that supposedly believe in the ethical teachings of Jesus, and they do the church thing, but they don't believe in the supernatural elements of rising from the dead, and that that will someday take place in the future because that seemingly contradicts everything we know about this physical universe. We see the physical, we see the physical die. How could this body come back to life? It's into that kind of a context and toward that belief system that Paul speaks about the logic then of denying resurrection. And this is where he presents this all or nothing case then for the resurrection. He says, some of you are speaking of and preaching that Christ and are accepting that Christ has raised from the dead, but how can you then say at the same time there is no resurrection of the dead? And he goes into then looking at what this all or nothing means. And that's what we want to look at. First of all, from the perspective of the negative, we'll see what this means. If there is no future resurrection of the dead, what does that imply? First of all, in verse 13, then not even Christ has been raised. If there is no future resurrection of the dead, Christ himself hasn't been raised. You see, the beauty and the miracle of the incarnation of Jesus Christ is that Jesus became truly human, just like you and me. He became us. It wasn't like some spirit being descending down here. That wasn't Jesus. Jesus became human. Truly human, just like you and I. Everything necessary to be a human, Jesus had. A couple weeks ago, somebody asked me a question. Does that mean Jesus had a sin nature like we do? No, he didn't have a sin nature. Why? Because a sin nature isn't necessary for humans. Now, it's something that's a part of every one of us, but think about it. Adam and Eve didn't have a sin nature when they were created. They were fully human, truly human. Jesus would have been like that. He, was cre he came into this world through the, the creation act of the Holy Spirit, through the Virgin Mary, truly becoming us, fully human just like us, or truly human just like us, without sin. But Paul's implication here is if there isn't a bodily resurrection, that also then would negate 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because why? Jesus physically died. That's an indisputable fact. A lot of people will say today that, you know, I don't know about Christianity and this Jesus. Couldn't, the, couldn't these early Christians just have made Jesus up? Any philosopher, scholar, theologian, even that's agnostic or atheist, would not deny the death of Jesus Christ. They wouldn't believe that the Christians just made all this up. Why? Because we actually have record of the person Jesus being on this earth, not just in Scripture, but in secular sources as well. If you hold that history at all, or the idea that we can know anything about the past from history, you have to accept the reality that there was a man named Jesus who claimed to be a Messiah and lived in first century Israel. That's part of history. Now, many of those agnostic and atheist scholars would even admit that some of the truth of the gospel or things that are in the gospel are true. And they would for sure say that he died. What they won't go as far as saying is that he rose from the dead. But he physically died. That's an established fact. And Paul builds on that here. If Christ hasn't been raised since he was truly human like us, he, I mean, if, we can't, if there is no resurrection, then Christ himself couldn't have been raised because he physically died just like you and I will physically die someday. And as a physical being then, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ himself couldn't have been raised. Further, if there is no future resurrection of the dead, preaching and believing the gospel, the things the Corinthians say they do, even if they deny this resurrection, is empty. Notice verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. If there is no resurrection, preaching and believing are completely empty. There's nothing there. I mean, think about it on Christmas Day, having this massive present that you prepare for your child and it's or for a child you can just kind of visualize this this big huge present that's set alongside that christmas tree and it's been there for weeks because mom and dad wrapped it early and it's sitting there and can you imagine the anticipation of that child as they're they're looking forward to getting that just the biggest present possible beside the tree and on christmas morning as they get up and they rip all of that wrapping off of it and they open that gift and all it is is just an empty box there's absolutely nothing in it i mean that would be sick and twisted but that is what our preaching and your believing is if there is no resurrection there. If there is no future resurrection, Paul says, our preaching and your believing is completely empty. If there is no resurrection, what I'm preaching you to you today has no foundation underneath it holding it up. Maybe some of you went into the restrooms. They are complete. They're open. Maybe after church you can go in there. I know it's a weird Sunday if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to check out the restrooms, but they look awesome, okay? Uh, but Delbert, as he was putting those in, if you notice the, uh, the, where the sinks are, uh, underneath there, they put this one, you know, basically a, it's like a cast iron or a solid steel, stainless steel pole that's holding that up. Why is that? Because if you put weight on that, what's going to happen if that pole's not there? It's going to fall. The resurrection is just that to Christianity. It's the foundation. It's the thing underneath holding all of this up. And if it's taken away, Christianity simply falls. There's no foundation to it. It's empty. So that my efforts this morning and your efforts of trying to stay awake and listen to this sermon are just for the fun of it. And I don't know about you, but I can think of a lot more things that would be fun if all of this is just empty. We could have slept in this morning. We could have gone out to eat for breakfast. We could have, I could have had a tea time at 9 o'clock this morning instead of having to preach here. Why? Because this would all be waste. If there is no future resurrection of the dead, thirdly, Paul says in verse 15, the Christian testimony lies about God. More than that, we are not 
We are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. You see, not only is this preaching and your believing without basis, Christianity itself turns out to be a great lie. We're lying if there is no resurrection of the dead. Not only are we liars, but we're lying about God himself. Who God is, what God has done. You see, resurrection is a work of God, both for us and for Christ. If you read through this, this, all the verbs of, of being raised are in the passive voice because we're saying that God raised Jesus and God will raise us someday. We're claiming that God vindicated himself by raising his son from the dead to demonstrate his defeat of sin and death. But if Christ didn't rise and there is no future resurrection, then we are misrepresenting God himself. And then maybe all the religions of this world are true and that it just is this big pluralistic view of God and all religions lead to him. And maybe we should just give it all up and coexist with them. If there is no future resurrection of the dead, further, verse 17, faith in Christ is useless. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, then Christ hasn't been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It's useless. Your faith itself is pointless. It doesn't have any real effect in your life. This whole thing is simply a mirage. And what you feel and sense inside yourself about God is just some kind of psychological machinations that we're tricking you into thinking. Because it isn't real. It's just making you think more positive about life. But it's useless. And it's useless because, as Paul says in verse, the end of the verse here, if there is no future resurrection of the dead, sin still reigns over us. Your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. You see, without resurrection, Christ's work does nothing to overcome sin in our lives. Sin still reigns. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ makes union with Christ possible. Since He lives, we also can live because we're united to His life. Because He lives, we live. And that's not just some song that the Gaithers wrote back in the 60s or 70s, okay? Yes, because He lives, I can face tomorrow. But that truth comes out of Romans chapter 6. Just look over there if you have your Bibles in Romans 6, verses 1 and following. Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism and death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Paul is speaking of what our salvation actually does. He uses baptism as that picture. He's not saying baptism saves you. In the early church, baptism was the final step of declaring you are a follower of Jesus Christ. You believed in the work that Jesus Christ had done, and then as you placed your faith and trust in that, you proclaimed that by passing through the waters of baptism uniting yourself with Jesus Christ in his death as you're buried with him in baptism and then in his life as he is raised. We are united with Christ in his death and his resurrection. And notice what Paul goes on to say then in verse 5. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. 
I mean, the logic of what Paul says there in Romans chapter 6 is that we are united with Christ in his death. We're united with Christ in his resurrection so that we will experience victory over sin in this life and then we will also experience victory over death in eternal life. But if we eliminate resurrection, that eliminates the union with Christ and eliminates our union with Christ even in his death so that we aren't Un, uh, from underneath this bondage to sin. We're still enslaved to it because there is no unification with Christ. And sin still reigns over us. If there is no resurrection of the dead, verse 18, believers who have died are eternally lost. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. And the biblical metaphor of sleep to indicate death, especially of believers, is a very beautiful picture. You see, in death, the body, not the soul, but the body, this physical body, sleeps in anticipation and expectation of awakening to new life in a new creation. That's, that's what this looks like. That's why we do that, right? Even in the ceremony of a funeral, placing that body into the ground in anticipation of that day when what? That body will come forth to new life. And as that body is there, even in that still state, it looks like sleep. It looks like it is just resting in anticipation of coming to new life and awakening to that new creation. That's the beauty of sleep and what it represents. The anticipation of what lies on that next morning. You ever had that experience where you go to sleep at night and you know this super exciting thing is going to happen that next morning? And when I have that happen, I normally can't sleep. Remember the, the, uh, the time that my, my dad took us as, as sons and my brothers and I, and we, we were on a trip to California and he took us and we played Pebble Beach Golf Course. And as a golfer, that's like a pinnacle kind of event to play that particular course. And I, I remember the night before that vividly. Guess who was not sleeping in the hotel room the night before that? Next day. I, don't, I think I saw almost every hour on the clock that night. Why? Because there's this anticipation and this excitement of what's going to happen the next day. And you fall asleep, and yet when you wake up that next morning, you jump right out of bed, and you can't wait to experience what is in front. That's the picture of the Bible, of what, in the Bible, of what death is. For the believer in Jesus Christ, death is that awakening into the new creation of what God has in store for us. All of that anticipation of what we will experience, the excitement and the hope that is there. But here's Paul's point. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then all of that excitement, all of that hope of what lies in front of us perishes for those who are in Christ. It's eternally lost is the language here because there's no resurrection. The believers in Jesus Christ are lost forever. And in verse 19, finally, Paul concludes that if there is no resurrection of the dead and if it only for this life we hope in Christ, meaning it's just for right here and now and there is no resurrection from the dead, we are of all people most to be pitied. Everything about our existence has been a big waste of time. If the idea of resurrection is only to produce hope for us right now in this physical life with no truly future life and resurrection, then we are to be pitied because we have lost everything we believe concerning our relationship to Christ, what that means for our past. I mean, think about what we believe about our past, that Christ died and atoned for our sin and saved us. We lose everything about our present 
Because we're, we're having this hope that that lies in store for us. So the suffering that we're experiencing, the trials that we are going through, we endure those because of the hope that lies beyond, yet all of that is empty. The preaching that we come to every Sunday, the believing that we do throughout the week, the devotions, all of that is just a big waste. And our future is nothingness because there would be nothingness beyond death. Everything about our existence has been a waste without the resurrection of the dead. But based on the testimony of what Paul says here in these first 11 verses, from these first witnesses handed down through the centuries to us, we conclude, like Paul concludes here in verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. And Paul says, I saw him. He appeared to me. Just like he appeared to James and like he appeared to the 500 and he appeared to the apostles. And so what does that mean for us positively? If Christ has been raised from the dead, we will experience resurrection life like him. Our, our resurrection won't just be some rotting corpse in a grave or some... Uh, um, cremated remains being put back together. It will be a glorified body like Christ's. That's what lies in front of us. We will experience resurrection life like Jesus Christ. If Christ has been raised from the dead, it, believers will experience life after death like Christ who bodily lived and appeared after his death, we too will one day live again after our death. We will experience true life. You see, heaven isn't our ultimate end. I know many people think that. When we die, we go to heaven. That's true. To be absent from the body, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, is to what? To be present with the Lord. So that when a believer in Jesus Christ passes, we go into, our soul goes into the very presence of Jesus Christ. What does that look like? I really don't know. The Bible doesn't give us a ton of evidence of what it looks like between here and that future resurrection. But we will be present with Jesus Christ in some sort of temporary spiritual existence. And that might have some kind of body to it. I'm not exactly sure. But what we are awaiting, according to the book of Revelation in chapter 20, is what? That resurrection from the dead. That resurrection to life. Where we will be brought back to life. And our bodies will rise. And they will take on a glorified experience in which we will awaken into not just heaven, but new creation. Into a creation that has the very presence of God dwelling on this earth again and us living in that, in our new bodies. Paul goes on to speak of that later in this chapter. If you want to read about it in verses 35 and following, he speaks of that. This is the beauty of even the picture at a funeral, the body going into the ground. It goes into the ground as a what? A seed. But it comes out of the ground as a plant. And so while the seed looks, that doesn't look like the plant, it comes from the same, the plant comes from that same material, that natural body that goes in there one day in resurrection will come out this glorified spiritual body. It will be different then, and it will be so much better than this body. It will be like Jesus Christ, where we will be able to pass into the very presence of our God and experience him in his fullness. Believers, we will experience real life, Christ-like life in bodily form after death. If Christ has been raised from the dead, and if there is a future resurrection, faith in Christ not only, uh, not only defeats sin, but it also powerfully transforms us. It does both of those things. You see, atonement has been made once for all 
so that in this present life we no longer remain under the control of sin and the tyranny of sin, but we now serve one who has freed us from the power and control of sin. We aren't under its slavery any longer. It's been defeated. And faith in Christ is powerfully transforming us. Our trust in the finished work of Christ redeems us from our sins and allows us to experience the transforming work of Christ through His Spirit that now lives in us. He changes us. We're in this state of being transformed from our old desires toward desires that better reflect Christ in obedience to His Word. We don't perfectly receive that now, but more and more our lives testify to the transforming work of Jesus Christ through His Holy Spirit. If Christ has been raised from the dead, we testify the truth about God's work. It's the truth that God vindicated Himself by raising His Son from the dead. The testimony then that our lives display and our mouths declare represent the truth that God has done. That gospel story will never be proven false. It will never fail. We sing that new song. I love that lyric in it. Um, where it speaks of the fact that that gospel truth of old shall not kneel and it shall not faint. It transformed lives 2,000 years ago and it's still transforming and saving lives today. It needs to be proclaimed throughout this world and on the lips of every believer. If Christ has been raised from the dead, then our preaching and your believing isn't empty, it's essential. Because the truth of the resurrection makes preaching and believing essential to our spiritual growth, our spiritual maturity. We need to be challenged by the Word of God from those who have been gifted to speak the Word of God and preach the Word of God and teach the Word of God and challenge us with what that means for our lives so that when we hear it, we don't just simply hear it, but we put it into practice. And so our lives are transformed more and more through the preaching and believing of the gospel. If Christ has been raised from the dead, lastly here, our entire existence finds meaning in Christ. The truth of resurrection establishes our faith so that our sin is overcome. The truth of the resurrection is transforming us to display Christ in our life. And the truth of the resurrection provides us with a hope that makes even death into an anticipation of going to sleep so that we can awaken to glory in that new creation morning. That's our hope, believers, in Jesus Christ. Because Christ rose from the dead, we will one day rise from the dead. I think Paul's point in this stretch of 1 Corinthians 15 is this, that as believers in Christ... We shouldn't dismiss or deny the future resurrection because of what it does to Christ's resurrection. Rather, we as believers, and for us as believers, Christ's resurrection must control every facet of our existence. It is everything to us. Is it everything to to you? Does your life display that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is everything. To what you give your time to, to what you're investing in financially, does your life testify to that reality? I said at the beginning of this sermon that I'm not a huge risk taker. I would not push all in on pretty much anything in this life. But this is the one truth that I am willing to stake my life on. And that is that Jesus rose from the dead. And that means that you and I, as believers in him, will one day rise from the dead. My challenge to you is, are you willing to stake everything on that truth? Let's close in a word of prayer this morning. The worship team will come up and lead us in one more song, but... Let's just praise Jesus and also ask him that this would be a truth that grabs hold of our lives. Lord, we thank you for 
just the truth of the gospel. The challenge of what this means for our lives. We claim, Lord, that we believe you rose from the dead. But as Paul puts it in front of us here, if there is future resurrection and if Christ rose from the dead, then that means everything for us. That should challenge the thoughts that we have, the choices that we make, what we give our time to, what we give our monies to, how we spend our time, what we speak about to our children and our grandchildren. Because this is eternity. And what we do with that right now in this physical world determines where we will spend eternity. So God, I pray for any that might be gathered here or might be listening online this morning to this sermon that have either doubted or waited or or whatever in response to your gospel truth of what you've done through Jesus Christ in the resurrection and what that means for us. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict even now of this gospel truth that Christ died for their sins and Christ rose from the dead for their life and that they will see that the resurrection means everything for our existence and God that they would place their faith and trust in that and that alone and receive the salvation and the life that you give us in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that they would, if any of them are here gathered and and don't understand that fully but want that, that they would come seek one of us out. Take that step of salvation today. Lord, I pray that for those of us who claim the name of Jesus Christ, that we would truly see what the resurrection of Jesus Christ means for us, what it calls us to, what it challenges us in the choices that we make and what we do with our lives. May our lives individually testify that Jesus has risen and we will rise someday. And that truth just permeates, Lord, through everything that we do. Lord, may this church stand on and be filled with that gospel truth so that it transforms our lives, our families, our neighborhoods, and this community, and ultimately this world for your glory. Jesus, we thank you for the work that you did on our behalf to become us, to lay your life down in payment for our sin, to atone for our sin, to deliver us from our sin, and to rise victorious, to ascend to the right hand of your Father so that you stand seated at the right hand of your Father over all powers in this world, and you extend that resurrection power and life to us as we believe in you and you send your spirit into our lives to transform us to reflect you more god we thank you jesus christ for that work that continued work that you will do till one day these skies open up and you re-enter this physical creation and you raise us from the dead in anticipation of that day may our lives testify to the truth of resurrection. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We invite you to stand with us. We're going to sing this last song that just, I think, summarizes uh, the entirety of our hope and uh, the testimony of the church, both now and forever. And uh, so let's just sing this out in faith and joy. One gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy 
my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. And oh, how strange and divine I can sing all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Follow after him with every breath. I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand. Before his throne, to this I hold my hope is only Jesus, and all the glory evermore to him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ. I hold my hope is only Jesus. All the glory evermore to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me and yet not I but through Christ in me yet not I but through Christ in me 
glad that you're with us this morning. Uh, really enjoyed our time. Again, as you leave, just consider the, the resurrected life that the Lord might in his goodness bring, even through your toughest times and your greatest sorrows. And entrust all of that to him as we leave. And may we, as the people of God, be radiant representations of Christ's hope, his joy, and his surety as we live out our lives, even as we navigate hard seasons. So that the world around us would go, there is substance to those people's hope. And I need to know what the substance is. And that's our prayer. That's our heart. But we hope you have a really great rest of your day. Enjoy it. Thanks again for being with us. And uh, we'll see you next time. Go in his grace.